1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to continue our series. Last week we looked at the great paradox that was in the passage. On the one hand, if you remember that, uh, be subject to those ruling authorities that are over us and at the same time live as people who are free. How, how does a believer become subject, especially to these pagan Roman rulers, and then be free living at the same time, free in Christ? So uh, we looked at that idea of being free uh, as believers because we're subject to even human institutions, to people uh, who have all their own failings and problems. We can be subject to them for the sake of the gospel. How? How? Why? Well, ultimately, because we are servants of God. And Peter now is establishing this idea, this theme that brings us into this morning of what does it look like to be a servant of God? Uh, Not an option, not not something that you consider, well, maybe this or not that. Uh, As a follower of Jesus Christ, you begin to discover that you're going through the fire on this. The heat's getting turned up. Uh, the, the call, we're going to look at calling here this morning, of Christ is demanding for a follower of him. So that was back in verse 16, being a servant of God. So now how does this new, this new life as a believer that Peter's writing to early new baby Christians And he's describing what this uh, newfound freedom in serving God and others looks like. So he focuses in now on a family code or a household code. Scholars talk about that because it's uh, not just Peter, but Paul also talks to the Ephesians and the Colossians about it in their time, first century, the family or the household was this bedrock foundational uh, thing to society. And much like how many people today view the house or the family as a a foundational critical piece to society. Uh, So same thing, maybe even more so back in the first century. Peter, (laughs) excuse me, and Paul addresses it because it's so important that believers now that we're following Jesus, still understand how to relate to, how to be involved in, how to live uh, amongst people who don't know Christ, yet there's some similarities when it comes to the house and to the family, how we should treat each other, but at the same time, some differences, some unique things now that you're in Christ. And that's where, well, sometimes, yeah, we agree, and other places, uh, we don't agree so much that the gospel becomes a pretty radical in how it not only transforms us, but the way that we view the household now in, within this new context for believers. So it's real important that we go with Peter, we see where he focuses in, we try to you know, quickly understand this morning some of the differences and some of the similarities and what uh, defines all of it. The, the big overarching umbrella principle that, that defines all of this. So uh, let's look at the passage here. This is a passage that uh, gets avoided a lot, or at least part of it gets avoided, and we'll understand why as we read it and as we begin to pick it apart here. Verses 18 through 25, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God." For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree." that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
By his wounds we, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We must start with uh, Peter's first century context. So the, the passage, a translation I have that we just read starts in verse 18 with servants. Maybe you have a different translation because sometimes it's translated bond servants, sometimes it's translated slaves. So we have to understand a little bit about servants or slavery even in the New Testament in the first century. It's almost impossible to look at passages like that without thinking about slavery in the North American, especially uh, American 17th and 18th century context, right? You hear the word, I read the word slave, and our minds immediately go to what we know about from American history. So we've got to understand that our history, our recent American history, is very distinctly different than, at least in many ways, in what Peter was talking about in his context in, context in the first century. So first of all, let me say this. What Peter's saying, and even what Paul says to the Ephesians and the Colossians, is not an endorsement of slavery. Not in any way. Just because he says what he says and the way that he says it uh, does not endorse slavery. Now, it's been abused. It's been ripped out of context. It's been used by masters, slave owners in American context. Uh, you, go, you go back not, not so far in our American history, and that's what was happening to manipulate and even abuse slaves in America. This passage was used. So Peter is not writing in this way for that to happen. That was not the intent. It was ripped out of context. We've got to understand that first of all. Peter is not endorsing slavery. Uh, it, there are many uh, within our context today, modern times, modern scholars, and many critics of the New Testament read that. Why didn't Peter speak out against slavery, right? To the church. The church is being transformed, is transforming society and culture. Why didn't he speak out on it? Well, that wasn't his goal or Paul's goal within this context of addressing the household, okay, within society at that time. So that's where we got to be careful in how we treat the text. Major differences, I already mentioned that, between first century slavery in the Roman Empire and slavery in America. So what do I mean by that? In first century slavery, race played no role and what was going on in the Roman Empire. Education for slaves was encouraged then. Slaves could own property, including other slaves in the first century. Religious and cultural traditions were the same as free people in the society at the time, and a majority of slaves could anticipate being emancipated by the age of 30. Many people, not everyone, it's not everybody's situation, but many people in the Roman Empire would sell themselves into slavery because that was the socially accepted norm at the time to move up in society, believe it or not. I don't know if you read that or heard that, but it's true. And if, they, and if things worked out, and if they were able to make money and save money, they could buy their way out of slavery, even become a Roman citizen in the first century. And that was the conduit. That was the way that they could uh, achieve that goal. So some slaves in the first century, they held middle-class jobs, what we would consider middle-class. Some were doctors, some were teachers, writers, accountants, secretaries, sea captains, all of that. So it was an established, slavery, the first century, was an established part of the economy in ways that were vastly different than the American uh, economy, especially in the South in the 17th, 18th, even 19th centuries. Uh, and some scholars say that somewhere between a quarter and a third of the entire population in urban areas in Roman times were actually slaves. Now think of that, where we're talking about many thousands of people a quarter to a third of them. And some of these 
slaves were followers of Christ. And that's why Peter is addressing them right now. Now, you know, their backgrounds, we don't know. We don't know exactly what's going on. Probably a mixture of these uh, new believers in Asia Minor at the time. Some of them became Christians because that's what the household did. Uh, the leader of the house, the father, and his family became Christians, so the slaves became Christians, but not everyone. And it's clear in the New Testament that there was, uh, at least with some slaves, so much freedom that they enjoyed that they heard the message, they heard the gospel of Jesus, and some became followers of Jesus independent from the rest of the household. They could do that, but that would bring into the household all sorts of other complications and issues that weren't there before. Just like if they chose to follow some other idol or, or some other uh, religion, and then, then they brought that new belief system into the household. So this is also a possibility. Now, within Christianity, as Peter's already talked about, there is what? There's freedom. If you hear that, as a slave, and technically you're not free yet, you're still a bond servant, slave to this household that you live in, but the teaching is now that I'm free, can you understand how that could bring some tension into where you know the roles were clearly defined prior to this new belief? And now I believe I'm free, and now that begins to cross over into other areas of life in the way that a, a person would believe and act. So Peter is addressing that. In Christ, in the society you're in, you, you're not, you don't have license for free-for-all. You, you don't just throw the cart over and walk away from it. There is a responsibility that all people have within the context you're in for a greater purpose. So to kind of really quickly summarize that, I hope that's making sense so far. Peter's goal is not emancipation from your current situation. He's not trying to address that. But the goal is transformation while you're in your current situation. It is the way it is whether you've got a good master or not. That's the way it is in, in this society, in the Roman Empire in the first century. Like it or not, criticize or point out failings, or why didn't they say this or do that, Peter, Paul, whatever. You know, you could, we could do that all day long, but that wasn't the point of the writing. The point is the transformation the gospel is making while in your situation, and that makes all the difference, especially now, <laughs> as we consider how do we apply this. And, I mean, our situation is, you know, in, in many ways vastly different. But there are some similarities because we can all relate to being in a situation that's hard, especially when it comes to employment, in situations where you sure wish it would be better, uh, and if you were in charge, it would be different, right? But does that ring a bell? Okay. Uh, then what is our responsibility within a situation that's hard, that's difficult? Even, like what Peter says, you're in a position where you're suffering and you have to endure it because that boss or those coworkers, or the people that you work with or people you go to school with, and we can, we can apply this in a lot of different ways, that situation is not going away and I can't get out of it, so what's the point of me in it? That's where the gospel applies for us this morning. So what does Peter have to say to the servant? not just the bond servant in the household, but everyone, okay, because it, it applies across the board, and he already said that. The, the, the bigger picture is everyone is called to be a servant, so how does this apply to servants in general? So number one is that word elevated. Servant, you are elevated. Peter addresses slaves directly, not generally, and he addresses them first. Now, it, within the, the passage here, it goes on in chapter three, he speaks to wives, and then very briefly to husbands. And again, sometimes the criticism is, why don't husbands get more grief, you know? Why does he, why does he pick on wives more than husbands? And it, it looks like Paul does the same thing. Uh, well, he doesn't, but it looks like it. 
And then why does he pick on slaves? Because he really should be freeing them and not telling them what to do in really bad situations. But it's actually the reverse of that. He's not writing in such a way that he would look that he's looking down on slaves or picking on them or even wives in that household situation. It is the extreme opposite. He's addressing slaves and their situation and in chapter three, wives, to elevate them. They are not on the bottom of society's ladder. By addressing them first and slaves first, who would typically be seen as the bottom rung on the ladder, he's put them up with everybody else in the body of Christ. Do you see that? So not just generally, specifically, slaves, listen to me. I get it. I get the position you're in. As servants, I know how hard it is. So I need to speak to you directly because now your position in the body of Christ has changed. You are not on the bottom. You are up there with everyone else and not just uh, up there in some kind of neutral general way, but you are elevated. You are elevated to the highest level because he goes on to talk about Jesus and that they have the opportunity to not just be you or me, uh, as a servant, as you've been changed and transformed by the gospel, you can see your place in society as like Jesus. Now, where do we put Jesus on the list? He's the head of the church. He is the one who is Lord. And to say that you get to be like Jesus is not putting you down, it's lifting you up to the highest possible place. Do you see that? So look at your role as you serve as one of Jesus. You get to be like him in this place, maybe lowly, maybe hard, maybe, maybe suffering place. You get to be like Jesus. And he says, it, and he connects it to your calling in life. Verse 21, for to this you have been called called. It's not just an option. It's not just a consider uh, this or that. You are called to this place. The word and the idea of calling with believers has been drugged through the mud. It's been misunderstood. It's been made into all sorts of things that it never was in the first place. We abuse and misuse the idea of calling all the time. Many people talk about in kind of glib, easy ways, my calling uh, in a particular place or job or environment. Uh, we throw It's one of those Christianese words. You know, I've been called to this. I've been called to go to Culver's instead of McDonald's. Or, you know, you hear, it's kind of on that level, okay, of usage today. Uh, but when God extends a call, and when in Scripture we see calling, it is, well, Scripture even says God's calling is irrevocable. When God puts a call on somebody's life, it's not a glib, whatever, hope it works out, try it for a while, then do something else. That's not the way God defines calling. If you are called by God, it is going to happen whether you like it or not. And Jonah's a perfect example, but there are many others. If you run, if you try to hide, if you try to work around it, if you try to switch things up, uh uh-uh. If you're called by God, and some are called to suffer more than others, by the way, then you are going to be in that position. God will have his way in your life, whether it's easy or pleasant or not. So our, our idea of calling has been so warped by our own personal preference, right? Uh, the, I would prefer to understand God's calling in my life as something that is bettering, that uh, that maybe makes me more money, uh, gets more acclaim, puts more focus on me and my skills and how good I am at things, right? Uh, That must be my calling. And if I'm in a place where I'm struggling or people aren't noticing uh, how efficient or productive I am, well, that must not be God's calling, right? Because I'm not being elevated to the place I want to be. That's how we've misconstrued and abused the idea of calling. Calling takes us usually, and Peter knows everything about this, because Jesus told him that when he reinstated him as a follower, as an apostle, you're going to go where you don't want to go. 
and that's my will for you, period. That's what calling does to us. So that, that's what Peter says in verse 21. Uh, how do we do that? <laughs> uh, now we're getting into the, the trouble, the fire, so to speak, in this, in this series. Where is it that we're going to go here? Servant, you are also, number two, to trace his steps. Mindful of God as you endure sorrows while suffering even unjustly. Peter points out he's a realist. Uh, you guys, some of you guys are going through garbage. It is not easy. Uh, and you are taking stuff that you don't deserve. Has anybody been in that situation? When you're trying to do your best, you have the best of motives. You work hard. You put in extra time. Uh, you, you do the best you could possibly do, and you still get garbage in return. That is unjust. And that, at, to some degree, if you've been in any career for any period of time, you've been in a position like that, you've had to suffer for it. And that's not right. It is unjust. It is unfair. So servants of God, even in that situation, are to follow Christ's example, Christ's suffering examples, so that we might, verse 21, the rest of it, after he mentions calling, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus gives us this, not just any example, he gives us the perfect example because he was willing to suffer so the Father's plan could be fulfilled. Jesus did that. All of the, all the plan, all of the, mis, uh, the ministry that he was involved in, including the cross, and all of what was agonizing and terrible about going to the cross, all of that Jesus did willingly, did not open his mouth in any vengeful, retaliation kind of way. Jesus suffered to set for us an example. Now, the word example is an interesting one. Uh, I think I've got a picture for this. Yes. Anybody remember anything like this when you went to school? I don't know if anybody uses these things anymore. Okay, you still do. All right, good. So something familiar here, right? I remember doing this, but usually it was a letter. At first you saw it black, and then you saw it dotted line. Is that still the way it works? And you trace over the dotted line, and then next to it, then you have to do it on your own. And when you're first learning to do letters, when you do it on your own, it looks nothing like what's right, <laughs> right next to it. I remember that. I was left-handed. I suffered, okay? When they tried to force me to use my right hand, and it didn't work, and I showed them, no matter how bad my penmanship was and trying to cut with scissors. Right? Right? Anybody else left-handed and went through that? All right. I'm, you are my people. We are connected. All right. We go through. Yes. I see that hand in the back. Yeah. So, anyway... Maybe you remember doing something like that. First century, uh, Peter uses a word to draw his readers in that would have been familiar with going to school. Uh, and especially if you were a Jewish boy going to school with rabbi, uh, with the teacher, you would have had, um, historians say it was some kind of a wax tablet. So they did something very similar to this but they would outline Hebrew letters in a wax tablet that could be, when they're done, smoothed over and used over again because there weren't stacks of paper anywhere. Papyrus was an expensive, costly thing, so they couldn't use that, so they'd use these wax papers and draw over the lines until they learned, until they learned how, to, how, to, how to write the alphabet. So Peter is saying, follow Jesus' example. Oh, I remember that example when I learned how to write. He's saying, with my life and my lifestyle, I'm gonna follow Jesus. And he's saying, follow him exactly, precisely. You don't look at any part of Jesus' life and go, oh, that part I'm not so much in on. But the fish and chips show, like John 6, you know, I'm all for that, right? Uh, I will benefit, I'll gladly benefit from the miracles and for the, from the really good stuff, right? I'll take all that in. But when it gets hard, uh, maybe not. No. Follow the example precisely. Follow every curve and every line as you go through the life of Jesus and the examples he gave. Know 
Jesus and make your life look like his. Follow his example. Now, if, if you take that seriously, tracing the life of Jesus, making yours match his, ought to be scary. I mean, that should make your knees shake, right? It does me. As I'm reading this, as I'm thinking about the demands of a life that truly, I mean, if, I, if I'm gonna set my goal to follow Jesus' example, very quickly I start thinking, well, how in the world am I gonna do that? Maybe, maybe you know of a passage, I think Matthew has it, and I know Mark, Mark chapter eight has a moment where Jesus is teaching uh, and Peter acknowledges Jesus as Lord, you're the Messiah, uh, and Jesus responds to him. But then shortly after that, I, I know that Mark 8 uh, has this moment where uh, right after Mark, or excuse me, yeah, right after Peter says to Jesus, your Lord, your Messiah, Jesus begins to then teach about how the Messiah must go and serve to the point of suffering and being killed when he goes to Jerusalem. Does that ring a bell? Peter's with Jesus for the Messiah stuff as he understands Messiah. But when Jesus starts talking about going and suffering as a servant and being killed, then Mark tells us that Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Can you imagine the, the ego that it would take? You just called him Messiah and Lord, and then, no, 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 Jesus, I'm not in for that. You've got this wrong. I mean, to even say that is ridiculous sounding, right? To point out where Jesus is wrong, and what is, you remember what Jesus calls him? He calls him Satan. <laughs> Not because he's a demon, but because unwittingly, he's just joined in with the plan of Satan himself. Because he's trying to resist the, Jesus, the Messiah, as one who would suffer. Jesus says to Peter, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter wants the Messiah without the suffering, and that makes him Satan. Messiah, yes. Suffering, no. Jesus says he is the Messiah that must go through suffering. And just like Peter, if we're to tell the truth, most of us go, I'm not in on that. And maybe you have enough ego to verbally, in your prayer life, in your posture before God, have enough of that, chutzpah, whatever, to, to try to take Jesus aside and go, you're not right. I'm going to live in a way that is victorious. I'm gonna live in a way that earns more, that gains more, and if I, you know, am in charge, then I'm going to consider my calling in a way that benefits me the most. Not, not what you're doing, Jesus. I'm going to do it. You see how similar that is to Peter? I mean, it's just the temptation to do exactly what Peter does is right there in front of us all the time. I want you, Jesus, as Messiah, but I don't want the suffering, and I'll find a way to do it better. Thank you very much, Jesus. That happens. It happens all the time. How? How do we possibly follow Christ's example? When none of, nobody wants to suffer. Are you kidding me? If I can get through life in a pretty pleasant mode and have everything work out, and the bills paid, and take a vacation every once in a while, get a new truck, and have a great family, then I will do that. I, I will do that. I feel called to do those things. How in the world today do we follow Christ's example? I, I know I've used Louis Zamperini's life uh, as an illustration before. I'm going to do it again because he's just, he was just such an amazing man. Uh, Louis Zamperini uh, survived just unreal circumstances. His, his bomber was shot down during World War II. He and a couple of guys, or one guy, other guy, survived in this nasty floating raft in the South Pacific for weeks. Uh, the Japanese found them, went to a POW camp. Louis survived 
unbelievable torture and humiliation. You can read about it in the book, Unbroken, 1945. He lived through it somehow, through it all, and was released. Comes back to the States, and the, and the, tor the torture, instead of ending, continued in his mind. Post-traumatic stress all over the place. Nightmares, uh, uh, just the wicked stuff that he would relive. It just kept on flooding over his life for another four years. And there's, there's this moment, and you get to, that's the payoff in the end of the book. You get to this moment where his wife, and they're about to split up. Uh, he's just driving her crazy. And she convinces him, they live in L.A. at the time, to go to a Billy Graham crusade, 1945. He was reluctant. He doesn't want to go. She finally talks him into going. The second or third night he goes, and he already told her, when that guy gets to the come down to the front part, I'm out. And he made that very clear. They get to the end of the, the session that night. Billy Graham calls for anybody who wants to to come forward. And on cue, Louis stands up to walk out. But instead of walking out, he walks forward. Something happens that he only could attribute to God happening in his heart and in his mind at the time. Something begins to happen, and Louis says, if you save me, God, I'll serve you forever. And that's exactly what happened with Louis's life. Now, that last four years, he is, you know, when he was being tortured by all this stuff, there's nothing he could think of more or focus on more easily than vengeance. He was bent on getting enough money to go back to Japan to kill those guys who tortured him for those two years in that POW camp. And he never got the money and his life was coming apart. He comes to Christ and lo and behold, he gets the money. I don't remember how, what the details were, but he gets the money. He goes back to Japan, not on a mission of vengeance, but on a mission of forgiveness. See, all those guys that tortured him in the POW camp, they've been rounded up and they were put in the same camp as uh, part of uh, their sentence, serving their sentence. And Louis goes back to speak to those guys to seek their forgiveness. That's obviously a blurry picture, but Louis is standing on the right-hand side. I don't know who the other guy is. They're standing in front of that prison camp. So this is 1945. He goes back to the camp. The warden of the camp gathers all those guys that had tortured him almost to death in one room, and he, his plan at this moment is to go back and confront those guys and forgive them. And as it's retold in the book, he has this question nagging on him. And his only question is this, would the peace that he had found in Christ be enough? How could it be enough? You see... It's only four years later. He's going to recognize every guy that tortured him for two years. He's going to be face to face with them. And the last four years, all he wanted to do was strangle him to death. Would Christ be enough in that moment to look him in the eye and forget? Can you imagine the, the turmoil inside? The emotions are saying, this is your chance, right? He lived for that. Everything's got to be going haywire. The question is, is Christ enough? Would, would his new relationship in Christ prove resilient enough for Louis to continue on his path of serving God? Because it was relatively easy to walk down the sawdust trail and say, God, if you save me, I'll serve you forever. Prove it. This is the point where his suffering can either continue in a whole different way or it can end. And as the book, man, the first time I read the book, I just broke down bawling. Because he, he, she tells, Laura Hildebrand tells a story of how he goes in and Jesus was enough. And he forgave, not because he had to, it was a great inconvenience. He went back because he chose to serve God by forgiving all of these people that he didn't have to. And in that moment, man, he could have done a lot of things, but he forgave him. Now, I hesitate to use that story because none of us are in a POW camp, and by God's grace, we'll never know any kind of suffering like that. So in one sense, you know, it's a great story, but pff, I can't relate to that. I'll never be in that situation, but the reality is this. 
we, we're all in moments where we're tested by the suffering that we have to endure, the trouble, the difficulty, right? And the same question comes into our minds, doesn't it, does it not? Is Jesus enough? Is he enough to get me through this? Whatever, whatever the struggle is, it, and then the way that we answer that so often is our emotions. We, we figure, we feel like, no, he can't be. Or, I can't go through this again, right? There's no way. What if, what if the emotions say, no, he's not enough? What if you choose to say he is enough? That's what Louis did. What if you choose in that moment, regardless of the pressure, of the anxiety, of the other difficulties, to say, I will trust in you, Christ, in this moment, no matter how I feel about it? That's what Louis did, and that's what we can do too. How? How do we do that? Final point. Servant, you are grace covered. Look back here. We can trust in Christ and act on, we can act on uh, uh, what, what Christ has done. We can act on our faith in a way that is grace-filled, not on emotions or our goofed-up idea of calling or whatever. So back to verse 19, Peter says, for this is a gracious thing, And then he also says it again in verse 20 at the end, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So some translators say, and I don't know for sure what's right, uh, but I think they make a good point. Some translators say the way the ESV says it is kind of weak, it's weakened. You know, it's tricky putting it into common everyday English language right now, but maybe a way that doesn't read so great for us today, but maybe is a better translation. Instead of saying, for this is a gracious thing, to say it more bluntly, for this is grace. In that moment, servant, when you're called to make a decision, what do you rely on? And I think the blunt answer is the best answer. This is grace, that, and this is what you've been called to do, to stand on and in and live out and act grace. This is grace, he says, because Christ suffered for you, leaving the example, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found. You can do good and suffer for it. You can do that. This is, he says it again, for emphasis, this is grace. Jesus makes it possible for us to stand not in our emotions, not in what I would like to do right now to get even, not even like what I would run to. I can stand in this moment because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus is more than example to follow. I just mentioned that. Peter says that. It's true. He's an example. But what's the problem with that? If you only see Jesus as a really good example, even the best legalist, moralist is gonna fail. I, I, like we said before, the, the tracing, just like write, learning how to write the letters, I'm, I'm, certainly I failed at that. How much more so am I gonna fail be following Jesus' example perfectly? Are you kidding me? So if we stop there, it's just a good moral ideal that we will fail on. So we can't stop there, and neither, neither does Peter. He moves on so much fo- forward and farther because he goes on to describe how Jesus is the sacrifice that covers our sin and gives us righteousness. Are you kidding me? No, he's not kidding us. He goes on to say, and, he, and, we, and if you're here early enough this morning, you heard that reading from Isaiah 53. Peter is the only New Testament author that, that sheds light on Isaiah in the way that he does. Because the ancient people, Hebrew people, saw Isaiah 53, this suffering servant idea, as kind of a general idea for all of, certainly all of Israel suffered, right? So the the application, the interpretation was in a general way. Only Peter says, nope, you got it wrong. Peter says a suffering servant is a one-man deal. It's Jesus. Look at how he suffered this one man, and how did he suffer, and why did he suffer? It's far more than just an example to follow. He does it in a way that covers our sin. In other words, he is the atonement. 
for those of you who uh, get into Old Testament, Original Testament, and certainly for the Jews. But for all of us, he suffered in a way to cover us perfectly for all time. He's the one who became, he takes on our sin, all of the brokenness, all of the self-centeredness, everything that we've done, everything that we will do. He is, his atoning sacrifice is that perfect and that complete that he takes our sin, he gets rid of it so that we can, verse 24, might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Not necessarily physically, although sometimes that happens, but the far more important stuff, internally, spiritually, everything that we've done that's wounded ourselves or any way we've been wounded by others, it's all covered by the atonement set free to live righteously. And Jesus is enough to lead us there. I don't have it on the screen, but think of it. How does he end here? For you are straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You know what Louis did? I don't think he saw physically Jesus as he walked into that room where his tormentors were. Jesus is a shepherd and the overseer. Jesus, we get to follow in his steps. That's what Peter says, right? Jesus walked the steps of suffering. He knows what Louis went through. He knows what you go through. Every time you put up with, have to endure that ugly, rotten situation, he knows he's been through it every time. And he leaves his steps, not around it, but through it. I just love how Peter ends that. He's the shepherd just like goofy, rotten, smelly sheep who are clueless and do stupid stuff and wander off. Just look at his footsteps through that path of suffering and by grace cling to him. We don't got it. We don't have strength. We don't have the energy. We don't have the emotional stamina. None of that. He knows that. He doesn't expect you to become anything else than what, anything you are right now. Just obey. Look at the steps of the shepherd and follow him. He, believe me, he lays it out. He knows the path of suffering. Walk with him and we can get there. If you're suffering, if, if this week you're looking ahead and you see situations on your calendar that you would rather avoid, if only I had a better job, if only I could get away from this relationship. Uh, if only this problem would, you know, I feel like God's calling me somewhere else. Maybe he's not. I'm not saying any of it's easy. It's not easy. Look at the schedule this week. Here's my, here's my application. Look at the schedule this week. Those situations you'd rather run and hide from or find a way around, what if Jesus called you into that moment? And what if he's sufficient? And what if you can stand in his grace and if the only thing you can do is see the next step, take it. Take it. Because maybe in that suffering, you will never see the results of it, of your obedience. Maybe the rest of your life is just gonna stink. Well, that's what a great way to end a sermon. But what if his calling is to produce something amazing that you're a part of that maybe someday you get to see by the grace of God, I'm sure glad I followed him. It was not easy, it didn't feel good, but I took the next step and he was sufficient for that and he was at work redeeming that person, that relationship, that situation for a greater good I could not have even imagined. Servant, that's all of us, as followers of Jesus, we're all in that category. Find a way this week by God's strength and his grace to follow his steps instead of running and trust him for all that is necessary in the meantime. Lord Jesus, we want to deeply, I know with reverence, as Peter addresses us, with deep reverence for you be more faithful and obedient to what you have. We really do want that. And we confess, Lord, it is a struggle.
And we're so grateful you know what the struggle is. And Peter knows what the struggle was. Lord, give us what we need in that moment to choose trusting, to choose following, instead of running away or seeking a better, easier option in the moment. Be glorified in those difficult, even extreme situations. Be lifted up. Lord, we pray that we would be found as a part of your plan to do something greater and more wonderful by following and serving like Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.